Okay, so. Okay. So I'm interested in many things around me. Initially, I don't know why I like any given thing. But the more that that thing appears in my life, the more likely I am to continue liking it. If I use that thing in my art, I begin to feel that it belongs to me in a way and I get to know the thing in a way that nobody else does. Other times, that thing gets dropped or lost, sometimes forever. At this point, it ceases to be mine. Being interested just because is a good start to anything. I like to let that interest have space to wander without too much analysis. I know that behind each thing there will be a trove of ideas, histories, theories. I will arrive at some of these as I travel. Others will lie dormant for good. Before any one of us can do much of anything, we must locate ourselves and our minds in the world in which we are. I think that this act of location is essentially where art comes from. It can cover a lot of ground, encompassing any subject at all. Most artists spend a lot of their time exploring where they fit in with things in a non-prescriptive way and free from the logical and sensible shackles that usually govern our culture and time. One of my ongoing projects is my handstand archive. As and when the feeling takes me, I do a handstand. I'm on my hands for just a very brief moment, but this moment is forever framed and frozen in its imperfection wherever I'm with and whoever I ask to take the photograph. The moment is one artwork, I suppose. The subsequent experience of someone looking at my handstand archive online, wherever that may be, is another. Four years of working with physicist Professor Ian Woodhouse gave me an insight into the process of scientific research and data collection. After spending some time evangelising about the value of using freer methodologies and modes of expression in order to look at and understand reality, I thought I'd see what happened if I applied some of the rigour used in scientific research to my own practice. This led to How Long is a Piece of Green, a project where I worked under the guise of artist as researcher, spending three months journeying through southern Africa, collecting pieces of green along the way in the form of photographs, writing, video, sound recordings and more handstands. These samples were my responses as an artist to the places and times in which I found myself. I jotted down everything in my field notebook as I went, noting the date, time and location and giving each sample a unique code rever referring to the observation type. At the end of the three months, all notes were transcribed and audio and digital files ordered and numbered. This information was then recorded and analysed in a series of very complicated Excel spreadsheets. The data was then plotted onto a map, which was hand-drawn to my own scale. The more time I spent in a place, the larger it was. This map has a comprehensive key and includes graphs and charts representing relationships between the location, duration and frequency of each data type. The map represents a slice of everything I saw, heard, felt and learnt. It is readable to an extent by anybody with basic map reading skills, but is more just the concept that is presented. The raw data is hidden away in journals and memory cards. Lateral thought is important, thinking sideways as well as forward. 
connecting with unexpected sources of information. For this reason, along with a few others, I like to step out of the art world and work with people from whatever discipline that they might find themselves. Through conversations and observations, I have learnt that often it is in the non-artists that the most exciting form of creativity is found. My work with Ian has taken on various forms, chats over coffee, exhibitions, public discussions and presentations, and workshops about deforestation in Malawi. This variety has all been based on our very early discussions about the nature of what it is to observe. Ian presented to me a scientific equation, and through this equation, a bit of abstraction and a lot of discussion, we realised that the equation could be used as a theoretical framework to understand the act of observation. So I'm now going to try and hand you over to Ian if he's finished talking to the guys over there, and he's going to talk a bit more about the equation, which you see here. I'll simultaneously try and follow his slides, so forgive me if there's a bit of discrepancy. Should I plug um, him in? But yeah, let's see if they're, if they're ready. Is Ian ready to, re to do his equation? I finished. Have you? I just, that is my, just my last slide. Wow. <laughs> okay, brilliant. So go, go when you're ready. Will you swivel, your, swivel the laptop round so we can see you? Once DB, are you presenting your um, Y equals now, or are we? No, no, you're presenting your Y equals. <laughs> All right, then. But can we see your face, please? You can. Just give me a second. It's <laughs> make <laughs> one. Just have to shift right over it. The laptop for you. Good evening. Hello. Hello. Right, so you have my slides, Alice. Is that I, right? I do, yeah. Would you like me to start? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see your members, so it's... Um... Okay, so the equation y equals kx plus e. Uh, what I've just been explaining to the audience here is that I, I was going to elaborate a little bit on what this means in a scientific context. So this is an equation which encapsulates the process of observation. And what I'll do is I'll start with each of the each of these elements and try to explain a little bit of what they mean uh, scientifically, and I'll finish by kind of giving an artistic interpretation of that to which Alice is, is welcome to respond and indeed anybody else. So the so why in that equation is, for me, it's about data. It's a, it's a recording. You can think of that in lots of different ways. A recording means uh, lots of different things to different people. It can be a picture, an image, a drawing, a sculpture, an essay, or a poem, any form of, uh, of collecting or recording information. And in the work that I do in terms of measuring the Earth from satellites, that it's primarily data that is being recorded. And it's either photographic, uh, it is electrical, it can be in um, radar or visible parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. But we collect it, the, the data in many different ways. X. X is the, this is maybe the one that we can have a bit of a debate about, but X is what I will refer to as reality or truth. And we can, we can discuss long into the evening what we actually mean by that and whether we, we believe that there is a, some underlying reality or, or truth. But I will simplify that by saying it's stuff that is what we share. So this thing, all this stuff that's the same for everybody. So it's when you, when you get rid of all the subjectivity, whatever is left is, is what X is. It may also be, you may also interpret it as, a, as what it is you want to expose. So X is the, is the hidden. 
and that is what you're trying to, in some sense, reveal. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to cheat a little bit with this, this uh, photograph, this example. So, um, I'm going to ignore the fact that really the right-hand photograph is a photograph and is therefore a type of, of Y. It's a recording. It's an image. I want you to think of it more like the X. <clears throat> so that that's what it is. That's the, the outside world that, uh, in some sense, you want to record. And then the drawing on the left is your, your Y. So that is your recording. That's your, your collection of data of your uh, thing of interest, which is X. And of course, I've chosen this example because it's very clear then that uh, Y is not equal to X. And even in a camera, of course, a photograph of a, of a person is not the person themselves. So even when you have something that's, that looks like the object, that isn't the same as the object itself. So Y is never going to be the same. It's never going to be equal to X. And that brings in uh, the next factor, which is K. So K is that K is the thing that transforms your X into your into your Y. So the the underlying reality, if you excuse me that uh, that terminology, uh, is converted into the recorded medium through some kind of process. That's the that's where the individual, the me or the I, comes in, or the or the physical processes of the eye or the hand or a camera, or an instrument, or some kind of physical model that's encapsulated in this uh, function, K. You can also, you know, words like lens um, or ideas such as a, a door of perception also characterize what K is very well. It's a, it is the filter by which your recording process um, perceives the, the object in question. And the final one on that is E. Technically, it occurred to me earlier that uh, technically, and then all the stuff that I've ever done scientifically, I use epsilon rather than E. But because Alice and I have communicated so much by email, we've kind of turned it back into just the, the letter E instead of epsilon. But it kind of encapsulates uh, what you might call error or uncertainty, the randomness. It's effectively everything that you don't know about K encapsulated into E. It's what you don't know, uh, or all the things that you forgot to consider when you were um, composing the, the equation. On this cartoon, uh, I like this cartoon, it's by B. Clavan, and it nicely encapsulates exactly what I'm, I'm, that equation tries to represent, is that you have an object on the table, which is X, and you have two observers that both have different Ks because the K incorporates all their subjectivity and incorporates their psychological baggage as well as the physical difference between the fact that they're on different sides of the table, the fact that their eyes and their, the lenses in their eyes may be of, of different quality. And as a result, the way that they record that object on the table is different. So you end up with two different Ys because of their different Ks. And that's how, so when we get look back at the actual equation, uh, to explain one of the things I thought of in terms of explaining what a scientist is trying to do is that scientists end up with lots of data. That's the why. And what we're doing all the time is, is trying to make sense of, of X. So that's my primary activity. That's what I spent all my PhD doing a long time ago, which was just looking at methods of solving for X given a set of Y. And that is arguably what um, what science is, is primarily about, is trying to make sense of, uh, of the world through a collection of observations. You could, and I throw this out as a, as a point of argument and, and to raise discussion, but you could make the argument that from an artistic point of view, the emphasis is actually uh, going the other direction, taking something about the, the world, the X, and it's the creative process of converting that to a Y. It's maybe more iterative than that, and it's maybe rather simplistic. But this is this is why I like this equation because it raises those kinds of questions. That well, maybe maybe art and science are actually just doing 
the same kind of things, just in different directions. It's not that they're diametrically opposed, it's this that they're looking at it from, uh, or they're, they're moving in different directions through this, through this conceptual idea of this equation. And underlying that is that the, the K in there is the, is the key thing that both of us are interested in. So we're interested in that act of observation. What is it? Is the filter? What's the lens that, that uh, influences the relationship between the X and the Y? And then the E is sort of stuck on the end there. And it's, it's a long discussion between Alice and I of whether or not uh, it's the case that scientists really want to get rid of that. They want to make that zero. Whereas artists actually might want to delve into that and get uh, explore it and push it to uh, more extremes. Maybe that's the interesting, exciting bit: is the random, chaotic element contained in E. And that's where I will finish. Over to you, Alice. Okay. Are you, are you back at the I'll just stand. Oops. Yeah, because I need to. Can you see me there? Yeah. You can yes. hear me all right, can you? Yeah. Yep. Okay. The Edinburgh people are nodding. Okay, great. Can you hear me when I do this, just so I know how much I have to direct it at you? Can you hear me when I'm speaking now? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Um, so, yeah, me and Ian have been talking about this equation for a long time. Um, we first had those discussions. Um, probably about four years ago, um, a sort of side, well, it's, it's another project that I do with him is in, in Malawi. Um, he runs Red Horizon, which is an organisation um, that, very broadly speaking, looks at the issue of deforestation in Malawi. Um, a few years ago, I went along um, primarily on a research trip uh, to Malawi as, as project artist and spent a lot of time... Um, observing, taking photographs, drawing, doing sound recordings. And I noticed when I was there that a lot of the time I'd be doing this, people would say this word to me, jambula, all the time. And I didn't know what it meant. Um, and I asked somebody and they told me what, they tried to explain what it meant and I didn't quite understand. So I asked somebody else who said something slightly different. And I kept asking new people and everybody seemed to sort of have a different idea of what it meant. But I broadly got to understand that it meant it meant just that, sort of recording an observation, essentially, um, which I thought was quite interesting, that they had this word that encapsulated the ideas that me and Ian were talking about. So, yeah, this, this image is, or these two images, um, that's Isaac on the left, who is a caretaker at um, Mizuzu Academy, which is a secondary school in Malawi. And I met him and was chatting to him about this idea of Jambula, um, and he was sort of having a look at my cameras, which gave me the idea of giving him the digital camera to take a photograph of me, taking a photograph of him with my with my 30 year old analog camera, which had a black and white film in it. Um, and these are the resulting two images, which um, I think sort of explore that idea of this reciprocal observation but very much from, from on the ground, very much from the personal perspective. Um, I was thinking about this place and yesterday just Googled Mizuzu Academy and on Google Earth, you know, this comes up and we see, we see it from above. Now, we all take this now for granted and perhaps don't remember quite how amazing the fact that we can do this is. And, um, you know, this is a very objective satellite view of that area. Um, and we can just peer down onto our planet in that way, which, you know, in the vast majority of the history of time, nobody's ever been able to do, and I think we forget that sometimes. Um, putting it a little bit in context, this is um, the Great Wall of China, and I was reading it as a short story by Kafka called The Great Wall of China, and it's set when the idea to build the wall was very first conceived, which was getting on for 3,000 years ago. So the narrator says, Our land is so vast, no fairy tale can give an inkling of its size. The, the heavens scarcely span it. Um, today, it's a sort of well-known fact that we can view the Great Wall of China in its entirety from space. 
So we can immediately get a very clear idea of the size of the Great Wall of China. Um, again, it's something that you know, we take for granted and we know, but thinking up until very recently, that was an impossible thing to be able to do. Um, similarly, this is an incredibly powerful image that many of you will have seen of the Earth from the Moon. Um, seeing it in its entirety, which I think a lot of people are very taken by, but again, not in the same way that the astronauts that actually see this experience that view in reality. And I mean, it's known as the overview effect, which has been described as being a cognitive shift in awareness when, when the astronauts see the planet from afar, which is a very interesting concept because it's implied that actually something changes when they see it like that as opposed to we see it like this here. Um, going one step further, we've got the pale blue dot. The arrow is pointing at us. Um, this is an image of the Earth from 3.7 billion miles away. Um, so again, this, we can now observe this. Obviously, it's not a human that, that has taken that image. Um, but our ability to observe has sort of increased ridiculously. Um, having said that, so we see it and we can process it to a certain extent, but I think that you can't process that at the same time as really thinking about the experience of what it is to be here. So taking a photograph of a chair or a car or a flower or whatever it might be. They're just such separate things. Um, so me and Ian have talked a lot about this and about, you know, our care of the planet, big issues of you know, climate change and very much born off the deforestation in Malawi and how actually to take this sort of personal care of the planet you have to understand this connection better. Um, so yeah, we've devised a, a project which hasn't yet been realised but I've done a series of drawings which hopefully explain this a little bit and hopefully one day it'll happen. Um, but yeah, so you've got the, the satellite passing, passing through space which is 500 miles above the surface of the planet. It's an Earth observation satellite, so it's recording what it, what it sees. Um, then you've got Ian in his, in his office, um, and he can get precise information from his satellite pals about when this satellite might be passing, um, and then he'll send that information to me, and I'll travel to that point, and then at the moment I know that the satellite's passing, I'll put my camera up at the sky. Oops, there's a slide missing that says click. Let's see. But anyway, I, I point the camera up at the sky and at the exact moment, here we go, the satellite's passing, I'll press the shutter. Um, so two very, very different ways of making an observation and recording this of actually exactly the same space at exactly the same time, um, but with very, very different results. Um, so you'll have the domestic photograph that, again, I'll use my analog camera, print off, and Ian will get hold of the satellite image, which, if we're lucky, we'll be able to identify a little human being in the centre, which we know is me taking that photograph. Um, and that photograph, obviously, seeing it in that context, you understand that what's being presented to you is there's more, there's more behind that, quite literally, which is the satellite taking the image. Um, so, yeah, this is sort of where, where we're at at the moment. It's something that's sort of condensing a lot of ideas into hopefully quite a clear... Um, output um, but that's yeah that's where we are um, Y equals is our blog that we just put lots of different information on actually so anything that we we have sort of find interest in it's almost a way that we communicate as well so giving each other links and stuff but it's a nice research sort of resource that anybody can look at and then that's Ian's blog and my website address um, so Yes, I think now we'll try and do a bit of a Q&A between us both. Lights up? Yeah, let's have lights up. Um, we'll just do that. So if you want to come so that we can see you. Does anyone have any questions for Alice and Ian as a whole? We can give them to London. <coughs> so yeah, we're going to open up to questions.
and we'll take in turns between Edinburgh and London. So if you have any questions for Alice or Ian. Uh, we have a question. We've got a question. Okay, go. Oh, Hello. Hi, Alice. Hello. How are you? Good. That's not my question, though. Oh, is that Mark? <laughs> yeah, hi. Hi, Mark. <laughs> Can you... Anyway. Uh, <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> yeah, there you are. Okay. Uh, so this is, I guess, kind of a comment that leads to a question, which is um, a <coughs> part of my research uh, is looking at translation studies, um, uh, which is primarily dealing with you know, language and text and things like this, and there's been a recognition over the last couple decades that uh, the translator has a, is a kind of a huge, has a huge K value, I guess, if we're using this, this um, equation, this formula. Um, they don't recognize necessarily an E value yet, uh, but the K value is really, really important in translation from one language to another, whether it's written or it's spoken. Um, and that the idea that you can and so there's a realization that you can never have an exact translation from one language into another, and that that's okay, and that there's a value in that. Um, and so there's a so my point is that there's a recognition in terms of kind of text and and verbal speech that uh, the K value is there and it's important uh, and it's of great value. And I guess in that sense, I'm wondering whether. Um, might have any comments or reactions to that, and kind of whether you've looked at kind of the idea of really if this is a means of translation what's happening, I suppose, between one equal value to another. So it isn't so much that there's a truth, and then there's a, a kind of representation of that truth, but there's two different things that have equal value, and the K, which are the X and the Y, and the K is you know really where the action is. Um. Yeah, um, it's, that's a really, really good comment and um, it's actually very interesting because a lot of like my own practice and probably my more private studio practice, I'm really interested in, in exactly that and I've done a lot of work um, with texts that I don't understand, so Chinese characters for example, I like to make texts, I make backwards drawings so that they become unreadable um, or backwards drawings of ancient Arabic scripts, which are even more unreadable. Um, and yeah, sort of looking at this idea that things do get lost in the translation, and in a way that's quite a, can be quite a beautiful and valuable thing as well. Um, but yeah, in terms of how it directly fits in with the projects or the work that Ian, Ian and I are doing, I think. We've, we've presented the ideas and talked about it in quite different contexts and what we say and how we present it very much depends on who we're talking to. Um, we're at the moment, we're, we're pitching this project to a, it's a sort of audience engagement outreach project. It's, a very, it's coming from a very science-based fund and it's for an educational yeah, outreach thing for disadvantaged young adults. So suddenly you don't talk about the concept at all, but you can still present some of the output. Um, but you're right in that this, this bit in between, and I think a lot, of, a lot of artists are sort of interested in that as well, and I think it's when, when words can fail, and that's also valuable, I think. And I used to try very hard to use words to explain what I was thinking all the time and I failed miserably. Um, so yeah, I think it, it plays a huge part. I don't know if Ian would agree in terms of, of science practice, but certainly for me. Does Ian have anything he wants to add to that before we open the question here? Uh, my my immediate thought actually was to, was to think of, um, <coughs> not a science thing, but it's kind of related. I guess, insofar as Zen Buddhism. So the tradition in Zen Buddhism, because <laughs> uh, Zen Buddhism has a, has a tradition of not using written texts for the very purpose that it's, uh, it, it involves, I guess, too much of that K, is that the, uh, and then just thinking about it, the, the whole practice of Zen Buddhism would be 
would really be to try to minimize that that cave factor as much as possible. And ideally, their ideal would be to get rid of it. So there is no translation, it's just the, as it is. Um, and then your X and your Y are virtually the same thing. So um, that's, that would be kind of my immediate response to that. And the, the interesting thing about Zen Buddhism is it's one of the, one of the few uh, meditative arts where you can actually scientifically quantify the stages of enlightenment. <laughs> It's so far as that you can you can do tests to see how how much baggage they bring to various problems and therefore have have more K involved in that process and the way that you rank them scientifically matches the way that the masters have ranked them, their pupils and so you have a have, you have a kind of a, a way of almost quantifying that mm -hmm. almost. Do we have any questions here? Just really yes. quickly, can I make the argument that he's already part of that? He's already. He's already a part of K. That's an unnecessary part of the algorithm because it's already a part of the observer. You have reality and you have Y. Then K, you, okay. he's already in there. In, I'll, in I'll the check they can hear you. Did you hear any of that? We didn't quite catch yeah. it. Okay. Someone here is suggesting that the E is already an inherent part of the K, and is therefore redundant. That that error is within the the me part. Comment. <laughs> Discuss. Continue your discussion. Um, I, I can. Well, the, the very easy way to get around that is to is is to say that if you have characterized your cave properly, then then yes, the e can disappear. But typically, certainly in a science context, there is always there's always random noise and random error. So you never you never quite reduce that to zero. And so you're suggesting that the error isn't always to do with the, the individual, the error can come from a multitude of places. Yeah, so um, so I'm immediately thinking that the that the uh, the optics of my eye are quite well defined by K. But because of this extremely bright light in front of me, I keep getting these bright spots all over whenever I'm trying to look at anything. So I have this extra noise factor which is uh, which is interfering with my, my eye's ability to see. So there is that would be an example of you know of adding something that is uh, uh, that's not directly corresponding to my the, the K of, of even you know, for a very scientific perspective the K of my eye is still quite well defined by I have this extra noise that is um, being added into that. Okay, thank you. I mean, we're over time slightly, but I, there's one question that I don't <coughs> think has been fully answered yet, which is how where did the Okay, so the, the idea of the, the formula as a vehicle for discussing methods and processes between the two of you, were other means of talking about that options? How did you, how did you find the formula as, as a vehicle for that conversation? I can't remember exactly. I think Ian was probably, he likes to try and explain quite complicated scientific things to me sometimes. and. Sometimes it's, it's, it's interesting because often it will end up being a more theoretical discussion. Um, and when he started talking about this, this equation, he was talking about it from a very scientific perspective. I was trying to understand it. And I think for me to understand it, I had to make it make sense to what I did and to what I understood already. So I think together we sort of batted that mm. between us and then started to understand each of the individual elements sort of together coming from different places but yeah lots of grappling and already it's you know every time new things come up and it gets sort of ironed out and different things get discussed mm. so it's a very flexible thing that essentially is a really nice formula to actually have a conversation with absolutely anybody as soon as they understand what sort of our rules about it are which are incredibly broad anybody can have a very different opinion within that framework. Okay. I think we're gonna have to we're gonna have to end it there. So thank you Edinburgh, thank you Ian and James. Um, thank you Ask Us people. Welcome, thank you. <laughs> um, and we're gonna we're hanging up now because you're carrying on aren't you and we're gonna carry on separately after here. Okay. Do you want to say goodbye and thank you everybody <laughs> Okay. Continue.
continue discussions on the equations by the top of the thing. Okay. Thank you, Alice. You're welcome. Um, we're gonna. Do people want a quick stretch? Five minutes. Refresh drinks and things. Let's just have a very.